You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is November 4th, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Dermatology for the Allergist. Our presenter is Dr. Mark Sirota. He's an Associate Professor of Dermatology and Allergy at the Denver VA Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. We're going to get started. For those of you that joined us on COLA this morning, this is our second hour. Um, in our second hour this morning, um, we have the pleasure of having um, one of our former fellows here from Children's Mercy who's gone on to better and greater things. Um, Dr. Mark Sirota um, is an allergy fellow with us and then went to Colorado and did a, a dermatology um, presidency and now is uh, board certified in allergy immunology and dermatology. Um, and <clears throat> he has spoken to us before, and I asked him to speak again because um, it's a topic that um, a lot of people request. Um, this morning he's going to talk to us about dermatology for the allergist. So, Mark, I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, it's really a pleasure to be back and speaking with, uh, with the fellowship here. So, you know, really the reason I, I developed this talk was because in my allergy training, I felt like I was seeing so much dermatology and so much skin conditions and eczema and things like that, but you don't know what you don't know. So, you know, I focused this talk on the idea that there are a lot of mimics of allergic skin diseases that you will see in your practice as an allergist, and it's really important to basically know what you don't know and have a differential diagnosis. When someone comes in with eczema, you shouldn't automatically assume that it's eczema or contact allergy. You shouldn't automatically assume it's a contact allergy. You need to have other things that you're thinking about in your mind as a differential diagnosis. Otherwise, you will miss things. So that's what, really what this talk is about. These are my disclosures. So I consult for a number of companies. None of these are particularly relevant to this talk, uh, but these are my disclosures. And, you know, I was an allergist first. So the idea is I don't want to give you a deep dive into any one skin condition. That's not what this is. I, I love talking about individual skin conditions, and I could talk for an hour just about any individual skin condition, but this is designed to be a mile wide and an inch deep, so to give you an overview of the things you should be thinking about and uh, ideas that you should have in your head in terms of a differential diagnosis when you're seeing a patient in your practice. So this is about practical dermatology to help improve your skill when you're seeing uh, to any form of skin patient. So we're going to focus on diseases related to atopic dermatitis, mimics of allergic disease, and diseases that you should not miss. I think that's a critical one. Diseases not to be missed is something that when you see a patient uh, in your differential diagnosis, you should have these things at the top of your list in your mind of how do I know it's not that before you go on to, you know, the common, you know, non-concerning diseases. So um, disease is not to be missed is something you should bookmark for sure. So we're going to review proper ways to describe skin findings, discuss some commonly encountered skin conditions, and like I said, we're going to focus on the mimics, and we're going to try to understand some of the treatment options and some of the diagnostic tools that we have in dermatology that might be able to help you when you're seeing a, a skin patient. So we're not going to focus on these things, things like atopic dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis and hives. Because you guys know those things. You see that all the time in your practice. You're very familiar with treating them. These are things you could probably lecture about very easily because these are things that you're very familiar with. So while I do love these topics, and so while I do love these topics, it's not something that we're going to focus on today because you also are familiar with these. So a few basic principles. This is opposite to what you normally do, but you should examine the patient first and then let your exam guide your history. So you look at the rash first and then start asking the questions about how long has it been there and, you know, any other historical points that you feel are necessary. But look at the rash first. It's going to help guide your history. Put the patient in a gown and don't forget to look at areas that you don't normally uh, like to look at. So undress the patient. Look at their genitals. Look at their feet. Look at their scalp. If there's rash there, that can rule in and rule out things for you and help you. Uh, and I'll show you some of those conditions where that might be the case. Pay attention to where things are not. You know, what is it sparing? Because sometimes that can help you. Touch the patient. Sometimes you can feel something, a lesion or a rash, before you can see it well. So just touch the patient. Don't just look. 
Um, use magnification if you need to. We use a dermatoscope. And consider evolution. If something's growing or changing over time, if something has expanded and gone into different areas, if it's changed in its appearance, those are all relevant things. Okay, so here are some of the tools. So the dermatoscope on the upper left. Um, when, a, when you press a microscope slide against a lesion like that, you can see if it blanches on the bottom right. So that's called dioscopy. Uh, there's, uh, you know, sometimes where we scrape the skin with a scalpel blade and look at it under a microscope to look for things like fungal elements. There's a punch biopsy tool, a shave biopsy tool, so lots of different things that we can help that can help us with diagnostic testing. Sometimes I think everyone thinks a dermatologist just looks at something and knows what it is. But just like an allergy, you do diagnostic testing, you do skin prick testing, you do PFTs. It's not always clear if it's asthma or vocal cord dysfunction. Well, the same is true in dermatology. You know, yes, we're skilled at looking at something and coming up with at least a differential diagnosis, but that doesn't mean that you always get the diagnosis right away. We still have diagnostic testing that sometimes we need to do. And the biopsy would probably be the top of the list. So dermatology breaks down to two things, growth and rashes. And this isn't a talk for allergists, so you're not going to be responsible for diagnosing and managing skin cancers and things like that. So I already eliminated half the specialty for you, but we're going to focus on rashes. But okay, one slide on growth, because this could save someone's life one day. This might be the most important slide of this talk, just because this is something where you could save someone's life. So we talk about the ABCs in terms of melanoma, which is the serious life-threatening type of skin cancer that patients get. So asymmetry, irregular borders, multiple colors like black, blues, multiple shades of brown, greater than six millimeter, about a size of a pencil eraser, or something that's growing or changing over time. And if you don't remember any of that, remember the ugly duckling or bleeding. If there's one spot that looks very different than the other spots on their body, then that is concerning. That's an ugly duckling, and that should be referred. And if you're not sure, just refer it because, you can, like I said, these, if they're caught when they're early, we, you surgically excise them and they generally do okay. And if you wait and they become more significant, deeper, metastatic, that's when people can unfortunately uh, die from, from a skin cancer, from melanoma. So uh, burn this slide into your mind, even though I told you it's not a talk about growth. And if you think this is just all academic, it's not. This was a patient. Uh, so I had given this talk to the Colorado Allergy Society. I gave that slide. But this slide wasn't there. And this patient was referred by an allergist about a week after I gave the talk to my office. And this was a patient who had a fairly significant melanoma near their eye. And fortunately, uh, it was diagnosed by their allergist, caught early. We biopsied it. And this patient uh, had this lesion excised and, and did fine. So this isn't just academics. This is real world stuff here. And this was an allergist who probably saved this person's life. So why, dermatol uh, why skin conditions don't read the textbook? Well, they can change over time. They're frequently altered by treatments that the patient does on the themselves or that have been done by other doctors. It can be altered with certain exposures, like sunlight, for example. And it can be altered from things the patient's doing to the skin, like trauma or excoriating the skin. So although I give you the textbook examples of what things look like, these are some reasons that you know, it might not appear like the textbook when, when you see the patient. So be aware of that. So one of my mentors from the Children's Hospital of Colorado, Dr. Morelli, since retired, he said, this job isn't hard. You either leave it alone, put a cream on it, or cut it out. The hard part is knowing when to do what. And that's pretty true. That's accurate. So uh, these are some of the things you have to think about when you see a, a patient with a skin problem. So just a few words on describing skin lesions. I think in your fellowship and residencies, these are the times to form good habits. And if you form good habits while you're in training, then when you're practicing in the real world, you will carry those forward and do a good job describing skin lesions. So you describe a skin lesion based on the primary lesion and then secondary features. So if you do a good job using these terms, you can describe what you're seeing to another doctor or to a dermatologist, and you can get a very good idea of what the patient might have just by the descriptive terms that you're using. So we'll go through some of these. So macule is a flat change in the color of the skin that's less than a centimeter. You wouldn't be able to feel this, like a freckle. So less than a centimeter flat is a macule. Greater than a centimeter flat is a patch. Less than a centimeter raised is a papule. And greater than a centimeter raised is a plaque. So those are the four primary things you'll see. If it's raised, it's a macule or patch. If it's, sorry, if it's raised, it's a papule or a plaque. 
if it's flat, it's a macule or a patch, and then the, dia the uh, size of the lesion tells you if it's a uh, plaque or, a, excuse me, if it's a, a you know, patch versus macule or plaque versus patchule. So if you should remember these four descriptive terms, you can get a lot of mileage out of them describing skin lesions. These are the primary terms we use. It's also a nodule greater than one centimeter, uh, and it's typically raised off the skin and usually has a dermal or subcutaneous component, so a little more girth to it than just a papule. So here's an example of a nodule. This is a keratoia canthoma, which is a type of skin cancer. Tumors are large subcutaneous uh, solid masses of tissue. They're, they're totally under the skin. So this is an example of a lipoma. That would be a tumor. So tumors don't have to be cancerous or malignant, but uh, this is a benign tumor or lipoma, but we describe it as a tumor because it fits this description. Vesicles are less than one centimeter, but rather than just being isolated lesions, they're fluid-filled. So they're filled usually with clear fluid. A good example would be HSG with the example of a vesicle. So we would call these, you know, crop fluid-filled vesicles on an erythematous base. If I said that to you, you would know it was HSV without seeing a photo or having any other real information because I described exactly what I'm seeing. Bola are large, greater than one centimeter fluid-filled uh, lesions, and they can be flaccid or they can be tense, um, but a bulla is large fluid-filled, usually greater than a centimeter um, uh, lesion. Example would be bullous tensiloid, and I'll show you some other. Pustules are small, usually less than a centimeter, uh, and instead of being fluid-filled, they contain pus. An example would be the photo here, pustular psoriasis, but there's many other things that can cause pustules, but little yellow pustule lesions would be pustules. You can also have burrows, which are linear tracts. They're usually from infestations of the skin, such as scabies or cutaneous larva migraines, and you can see the track on the photo is a, is a nice linear um, track underneath the skin. We call that a burrow. So those are the primary lesions, and there are others, but I gave you some of the, some of the highlight ones that you might use in your practice. Um, if you only remember four, remember macule, patch, papule, plaque. Those will get you a lot of mileage. And then you're going to use a descriptive term. So that would be like the noun, and then the secondary lesion would be kind of like the adjective, where you're describing what the papule looks like or what the plaque looks like. So you can say scaly or erythematous or crusted or lichenified or eroded. So you're kind of using that descriptor uh, to help in terms of uh, the primary lesion. And then you can talk about certain patterns that are on the skin. So I highlighted three. You might be familiar with dermatomal. You're probably not familiar with blastoid or kebnerized, and there are others, but I'll highlight some for you here. Um, and if you're interested, you can kind of read more about these in any, any uh, dermatology textbook in terms of describing uh, skin, skin patterns. They can be very helpful. So one thing that kind of bothers all of us, and a good highlight of this uh, as an example of describing skin lesions, is instead of saying something is maculopapular, which you know kind of makes no sense now, right? Because macules are flat, papules are raised. And you can't, you know, saying something fl a flat raised rash kind of is silly and makes no sense. So instead, maybe we should say something like erythematous, morbilliform, blanchable macules and papules coalescing to form confluent patches. I think that's a much better description of this rash. And you can see if you just put those descriptive terms together, you can describe a rash to someone. So measles, other viral xanthoms, drugs, things like that can cause what you might refer to as a maculopapular rash. Maybe we can use a more descriptive term that helps uh, the doc, the, uh, you know, your colleagues understand what you're seeing. And this is just one example, but using as many of the descriptors as you can really helps uh, in terms of um, documenting in your notes. So this is the Kebner phenomenon. You're familiar with the amount of graphism for hives, but you may not be familiar with the Kebner phenomenon. So this occurs with inflammatory skin conditions the classic example would be psoriasis, but not just psoriasis. And if you stroke or traumatize the skin in a patient who has, in this case, psoriasis, you will see linear uh, development of a linear psoriatic plaque in the area that you excoriated or traumatized the skin. And this happens even when a patient has surgery and you um, make an incision along uh, their skin, you can get psoriasis plaque along that incision line. So this is the Kebner phenomenon. 
You're familiar probably with dermatomal distribution. So that follows along the roots of nerves. So as the nerves exit the spinal cord, you know, they take their path uh, innervating different areas of the skin. And they generally occur in a band-like pattern. The classic example of this would be herpes zoster, uh, you know, shingles, followed dermatomal distribution. But you may be less familiar with Blaschko's lines. So Blaschko's lines trace the embryonic stem cell development of the skin cells. So they're more world-shaped than they are just bands. They're more like in S-shapes in the world. So they follow a V over the back, S-shaped over the chest and stomach, um, and kind of more wavy, almost like a you know, circular pattern over the head. So those are Blaschko's lines. Why is that important? Well, there's diseases that can follow along Blaschko's lines. So the classic example would be in a child having a condition called lichen striatus. If you saw this on a child's arm and you weren't familiar with the blastoid distribution, you might think this was a case of herpes zoster. You might think this was a case of allergic contact dermatitis. But if you're familiar now with this blastoid pattern and you see that in a child, you would diagnose lichen striatus, which is a benign self-limited condition that typically resolves as the child gets older. So you, know, you can see why this would be relevant. So how would we describe this, knowing what we know now? Well, I would call this an erythematous, eczematous, perhaps zerotic plaque, um, perhaps li slightly lichenified with some accentuated skin markings on the antecubital fossa. So this is a classic example and description of eczema. And I said this isn't going to be covered because you are very familiar with eczema. But you should be familiar with the typical locations that it occurs in because that will help you when you're deciding if it's eczema or not. And I highlight the cheeks in children where you don't see that as much in adults, but the cheeks are real common in children. Folds of the elbows, so antecubital fossa. Folds of the knees, the popliteal fossa. Neck, eyelids, those are common areas uh, for eczema. But eczema can be almost anywhere, and depending on the severity, the patient can have a very large extensive surface of eczema. But these are the common parts, and it always makes you feel a little, a little more confident in your diagnosis when they have antecubital fossa or popliteal fossa or something like that in their, in their um, exam. Don't forget systemic diseases associated with eczema. These are rare things. I really don't see them in my practice, but you should be aware of them. And in, in an allergy immunology practice, these are things that could come up. So hyper IgE, Wiscott Aldrich, and I also highlight nutritional deficiencies. You know about acrodermatitis enteropathica, which is a zinc deficiency, but there can be a relative zinc deficiency in atopic dermatitis patients in general. And in my fellowship at Children's Mercy, uh, the nutritionist had a whole protocol for replacing someone's zinc, uh, and I have seen miracles happen where patients were miserable with eczema, and they had low zinc levels, and you replace their zinc, and it was like a miracle. They were like a new child. So I always remember that uh, when you can't get someone under control, don't forget zinc. So allergic contact dermatitis, I also said I wouldn't talk about this, but remember geometric distribution, remember to take a history patch testing, and not, not oral antibiotics, not IV antibiotics. This was a patient I saw in consultation in the hospital, and that patient had a procedure. She's pregnant, and she had a procedure on her abdomen, and they put an adhesive bandage there, and that's what developed. And they decided to admit this pregnant woman and give her IV vancomycin. And I, I give you that pearl because these can very easily look like and be mistaken for infections because they get yellowish and crusty and, and bullish sometimes. And it doesn't mean they're infected. It just means it's a vigorous inflammatory response. So um, just pay attention to that when you see a potential contact patient um, or if you're consulted for that. So an important point here, when you biopsy the skin, on the left is normal skin. So on the top, you see the stratum corneum, which you'll notice has no cells. There's no nuclei there. Those are dead, right? So the cells essentially move up from the dermis, extrude their nuclei. And when they get to the top layer, they become the stratum corneum, and they have no nuclei there. So that's called basket weave orthokeratosis. So you can see how you have this basket weave pattern of the epidermal cell. And what you see on the right uh, is fungiotic dermatitis. So if you look further down into the dermal layers, instead of all those cells being nicely connected, they are being ballooned and spread out by those white areas, and we call that spongiosis. Okay, so spongiotic dermatitis can be caused by a number of conditions in the dermatitis category, such as 
atopic dermatitis, allergic contact, numular, all these different things, even bug bites, can all look exactly like that. So when you biopsy something that you think is eczema or dermatitis, but you're not sure, you get back spongiotic dermatitis. The pathologist is just going to put in, quote, unquote, backslash sponge derm. They're just going to give you a copy and paste describing this condition, but it's not going to help tell you what's causing their dermatitis. It's not going to say it's contact versus irritant versus atopic versus numular. So don't think you can separate out forms of dermatitis in general by doing a biopsy. It's just going to tell you you're in the dermatitis category, which might in and of itself be very useful information, but don't think that you can separate out categories of dermatitis by a biopsy alone. It comes down to your exam history and other factors. It can sometimes give you something like, you know, they're seeing a lot of eosinophils and it's consistent with a, you know, drug reaction or contact reaction, but in general, it's not going to give you the diagnosis or what's causing their problem. So here are diseases associated with eczema that you should be familiar with when you see an eczema patient. The first is ichthyosis vulgaris. So this is an autosomal dominant condition. You see fish scaling and mosaic lines. So some people call it kind of mosaic, where if you look on the right there, you can see how those pieces of, like, you know, extra skin kind of look like a mosaic pattern. It's associated with a filaggrin mutation most commonly, and we just treat this with liberal moisturizers and keratolytics. Don't underestimate, part of the reason I put this on here is don't underestimate keratolytics. If you're applying uh, medication like a steroid onto somebody's skin, and they have a lot of extra dead skin there, you're just putting it on that stratum corneum layer. You're not getting the steroid down to the dermal layers, which actually have the immune cells that you're trying to treat, right? You're trying to get that steroid to be uh, uptake into uh, the inside of the cell so the steroid can exert its action on the nucleus. Well, if all you're doing is, a, if all you're doing is applying it to the stratum corneum layer, those cells are dead. They don't even have a nuclei. So you have to do something to uh, keratolize, to destroy and break up all that dead keratin that's on top. Otherwise, you're essentially just applying your medication onto a, a shield of dead skin. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, but if you think about it, that's how steroids work. So you have to do something to get it where it needs to be. So here's the antecubital fossa. So we would say, okay, this patient has eczema. They're also seeing me for allergies and asthma. But they also have these small flesh-colored papules with a central umbilicated center on a background of erythematous, ex of, a, of an erythematous, eczematous, uh, you know, dry, xerotic plaque. So what is this? This is molluscum contagiosum. So this is a viral infection. It's in the pox virus family, very common in children. You can see it on opposing skin surfaces, so we call them kissing lesions, you know, where if you fold your elbow in, you can self-inoculate yourself, and you can get molluscum on both areas. Or another common one's under the arm and the armpit, where you can get it under the arm and the armpit because you're self-inoculating yourself. And you can get molluscum dermatitis. So there's always a chicken or the egg argument. Did the molluscum come first and cause the eczema rash? Did the eczema come first and create a barrier dysfunction and cause the molluscum to be able to go there? The answer is it could be either. You don't know. But the point is you have to treat both. So you have to do something for the molluscum and also do something to treat the dermatitis that's there and help with the barrier dysfunction. You can't just do one or the other. So here's a good example of molluscum dermatitis. Clearly this patient has molluscum. Clearly, this patient also has an eczematous rash, as the patient I saw in my practice, um, and you have to do something to treat both. You'll notice the eczema lesions, excuse me, you'll notice the molluscum lesions are very red and, and inflamed. That's a good sign. Part of the rash being there is the fact that your immune system is responsive to the fact that there's molluscum there. So when you see these things getting red and irritated, you say, good, that probably means it's on its way out and the immune system is, is responding as it should. So you can treat with nothing and just do benign neglect. And you can try all these other things. I recommend a steroid for the dermatitis and then something destructive for the molluscum. Highlighted in red is a board question. This will 100% be on your board, which is a miquimod cream, which you can apply to the molluscum lesions. You don't need to remember it's used for molluscum. It's actually off-label for that. But you should remember that it antagonizes uh, TLR7. Excuse me, I think that should say agonizes TLR7. It stimulates TLR7 to uh, attack the molluscum. And interestingly, you can also do intralesional candida you guys test for candida in your skin prick testing for allergies, but did you know that we use it in dermatology and we inject it into lesions like warts and molluscum, 
and because your immune system knows to go there and sample the candida uh, to find it finds the candida that's there it also samples the molluscum lesion while it's there and it points the immune system in that direction and then just by injecting a couple of lesions the immune system will start to destroy all the lesions of molluscum even on distant sites of the body so when a pa when a pediatric patient has a hundred of these things maybe they'll want to put a micromod on a hundred different lesions well why don't we just stimulate their immune system by just injecting a few of them so that's another interesting point that analogists might find useful so another disease associated with eczema, do you guys know what this is? These are, you know, diffuse, punched out, yellowish, crusted um, erosions uh, from maybe vesicles uh, around the mouth and chin of this patient, but can be all over the body in an eczema patient. Any ideas? Impetigo. Uh, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good um, guess, actually. Impetigo would be in the differential. But remember, when I say punched out, possibly vesicles, all over the body of an eczema patient, the first thing you should think about is eczema herpeticum. So this is HSV superimposed on pre-existing eczema, and this is terrible, horrible. Sometimes the patients uh, need to be admitted and usually treat with IV acyclovir and then discharge home with oral acyclovir. But this is, uh, so this is kind of one of the few scenarios where HSV becomes widespread. The other would be is if the patient's an immunosuppressed or HIV patient, but um, just by having eczema, you can have such a barrier dysfunction that they get widespread eczema herpeticum. So you would, I, I think the major point is, you would want to unroof one of these and culture it for HSV. You would also culture it for staph, as you said, and um, you would want to uh, preventatively maybe even treat with both. But the, what the patient really needs is acyclovir. But this was the next one, so you were just one side off. And you can see these look fairly similar, but this is yellowish, honey-crusted uh, papules coalesce into plaque. Um, on the face, you know, it can be anywhere. Um, a lot of times this is in younger patients from excoriating and they get um, staph and strep infections. Um, you can also, interestingly, get flaccid bullets. This would also be um, impetigo. So you're probably familiar with the first one. You may be less familiar with this one. And you can culture the fluid inside here and it will be uh, positive for either staph or strep, usually staph. The so staph aureus is the most common, but could also be group A beta hemolytic strep. You want to be aware of post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, and you should be checking for that if you diagnose impetigo in these patients. It's actually more common than in strep. So we treat strep with antibiotics to avoid the complications of strep, but post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis is actually more common in impetigo, um, and you would treat with antibiotics, um, usually something like cephalexin, unless the staff happen to be MRSA. So this also could be mistaken for these things, but this is a different condition. So this is thick, adherent, greasy, scaly plaque on the scalp of a baby. Scalp of a baby makes it a little easier. This is cheating a little bit when you hear that. But the diagnosis here would be seborrheic dermatitis. So cradle cap in infants, but it can affect all ages. And it's an inflammatory reaction to the normally appealing, uh, appearing malassezia on the skin, which is a lipid-dependent yeast, which is why it feeds off of the lipid in the oil glands of the scalp, eyebrows, around the nose, and why you don't see it in areas that don't have as prominent sebaceous glands. So in a baby, you have more prominent sebaceous glands uh, in, in that uh, neonatal period, which is why it loves this cradle cap situation, but you definitely see this in adults all the time. So here's an adult that has this. Again, you could mistake this for something like impetigo. You could mistake it uh, for a contact allergy. You could even look at this and say that's a butterfly rash. Maybe the patient has something like lupus. But if you look at the if you look at the hairline and the eyebrows and see these white, flake, flaky, greasy, scaly areas, um, this would be consistent with seborrheic dermatitis. You treat that with ketoconazole cream or shampoo to knock down the malassezia that's there, and you can add a topical steroid for the redness and irritation if you need to. I usually do both, uh, and that usually takes care of it. And in a worst-case scenario, you can do oral antifungals uh, as well, something like fluconazole, the same thing we use to treat yeast infections in women. So now it's diseases from excoriating the skin. So the first category was those are things that can be associated with eczema. So you could see those things on top of just having regular eczema, like molluscum, impetigo, eczema herpeticum, seborrheic dermatitis, all these different things, you can associate those with eczema patients, right? So here's diseases from excoriating. These are itchy skin conditions. Um, so 
Does anybody know what this is? This is a hyperpigmented, slightly scaly, very pruritic, almost a burning uh, type itch uh, over unilaterally over the scapula. Does anyone know what this is? Okay, so this is a condition called notalgia parasitica. It is associated with the rami of the spinal nerves that arise from T2 to T6. So this is not a skin condition and it's not an allergic condition. This is a nerve condition and we can treat it with a topical steroid, but the usual treatment would actually be topical capsaicin. Capsaicin is the same chemical that's in really hot peppers and it desensitizes the nerve. So there's a protocol to apply that to desensitize the nerve and make it fire its neurotransmitters so that it's no longer flaring up like this and causing this reaction. But you could easily mistake this for a contact allergy or something like that. But when you see a brownish area over the scapula, and really brownish areas like this in general, think nerve first. Don't automatically assume this is some sort of contact reaction. Another one that uh, is associated with with chronic scratching is the classic example, which is lichen simplex chronicus. This is an erythematous, hyperkeratotic, thick, lichenified plaque. Lichenified means, you know, thickened from scratching, basically. Um, so this would be the classic example. Another example would be perigo nodularis. These are individual erythematous excoriated nodules with central serum crusting. Uh, and the tip-off to this would be that it's not an area that patients can't reach. So you're not going to get lichen simplex chronicus, you're not going to get paragonodularis in areas like the mid-back because the patient can't reach there. So you would see the top of the back and the bottom of the back, but then you would have this pristine area in the middle of the back. So paragonodularis. This can be associated with other conditions. This in and of itself isn't its own condition. It could be that the patient just has psychogenic uh, itch where they're, you know, having anxiety and depression and picking at their skin. But it could also be that they just have bad eczema and they're picking at their skin. But when you see lots of these, people who are not dermatologists sometimes freak out and think that they have some weird, you know, plague rash or something, you know. They diagnose the first case of smallpox in the last 50 years. But usually what it is is the patient doing it to themselves. So look at the distribution and see if it's a distribution where a patient would be kind of clustering it and doing it to themselves. The extreme example is a patient I saw at the VA here, and he was doing this after getting back from a deployment and just had really bad PTSD. And that white, yellowish area you're seeing that's shimmering in the light is subcutaneous fat. So he's actually excoriating his skin down to the fat. And you can see those hypopigmented areas from prior areas of involvement where he was digging at his skin, they healed and didn't tan normally. So this is a, this is a, psychia this is a psychiatric case, 100%. So diseases you could mistake for eczema. Here are hypopigmented, white, slightly scaly macules, usually oval shape, on the posterior neck, uh, around the ears, on the shoulders, on the back. Uh, you guys know what this one is? Something alpha, for God. No? Okay. That's why we're doing it. So this is tinea versicolor. So classically hypopigmented, especially in darker skinned people, but it, the word versicolor is because it can be more reddish or pinkish, especially in lighter skinned people. You can diagnose it just clinically because it usually is in these areas like the back and neck and chest, and they have these like oval, circular, slightly scaly. And you kind of get a feel for what fungal stuff looks like, and this looks like a fungal rash when you get enough experience looking at them. You treat with topical or oral antifungals, and you can diagnose it on the KOH scra uh, scraping. So on the right there, you can see the hyphae, um, which we call it, you, you guys learned it as spaghetti and meatballs, which you see the, the hyphae and uh, the eggs. But I call it more um, macaroni and meatballs. It looks a little more like curved macaroni shapes. But regardless, you can usually diagnose this clinically. I very rarely need to scrape this to confirm the diagnosis. But here is an oval, hypopigmented, non-scaly patch on the cheek of a child. So you could think this is tinea versicolor and no one would fault you. You might think this is vitiligo and no one would fault you. But if the patient has eczema and it's on their cheeks or it's on their arms and it's not fully depigmented, it's just hypopigmented, then you wouldn't necessarily think it was vitiligo. 
And if it didn't have that scaly aspect to it, you wouldn't necessarily think it was tinea versicolor. But this is something you see all the time in children with eczema. This is called pityriasis alba. So more common in atopics, definitely more obvious in darker skin patients. It's flat, usually not scaly, and if you KOH it, it will not grow fungus, and you don't need to do anything about this other than just reassurance and education. I do also comment, tinea versicolor and this usually pops out in the summer when people are tan, getting more tan. So if they, a lot of times patients will say, oh, I was at the pool and I think I got something, or I, I went to the tanning bed and I got something, you know, I got an infection from the tanning bed. And you say, no, you know, number one, don't use tanning beds, they cause skin cancer. But number two, it didn't give you the rash, it's just that you have tinea versicolor that was blending into your skin. And once your other skin started tanning, the skin that has the infection doesn't tan because that organism produces salicylic acid, or excuse me, azelaic acid, which prevents uh, normal tanning of the skin. So that's why it popped out in the summer, and that's why we can see it, because it looks different than normal tan skin. So here are erysematous, eczematous, circular plaques. I would call them numular plaques on the hand or the trunk or the extremities of usually an older patient. So maybe someone in their, you know, 60s, 50s, 50s, 60s, 70s. But they can be in other people, but I see it more commonly in older patients. You guys know what this one is? No? Okay. This one is numular dermatitis or coin-shaped eczema, discoid eczema. Frequently confused with tinea corporis with ringworm. No one would fault you for confusing that. Everybody does. You differentiate it by scraping the skin and culturing it uh, or, and uh, looking at it under the microscope or culturing it for fungus. If you guys don't have the comfort level or ability to do a skin scraping and look at it under the microscope or with a KOH prep, that's fine. Just scrape it, send it in a... Uh, in a, in a regular, like a urine specimen cup um, for fungal culture, you can send that right to your lab in the Children's Emergency, and they will culture it for fungus, and they'll tell you if there's fungus there, um, just like you would swab someone for strep or swab their skin for sap. You can, you can scrape their skin for fungus and see if it grows fungus. Um, and then you would treat with a potent topical steroid. So here is one that everyone should recognize because this is misdiagnosed all the time, especially by non-dermatologists. So does anyone know what this is? This is, erysem I, I would say, erysematous small papules clustered around the inferior nair, nares around the chin on a base of erysematous eczematous patch, on the base of like an eczema area. So you kind of have this eczema, acne, overlap thing. Does anyone know what this is? All the time, people think this is a contact allergy. This person's been patch tested for their cosmetics. This person has been treated for impetigo. Uh, but that's not what this is. So this is called perioral dermatitis or perioral facial dermatitis. And it really looks like a combination of eczema and acne. And this picture around the nose like that, see how it runs right up into the nares? That is super classic for this. You can see it around the mouth and chin, and you can also see it around the eyes there, but it kind of looks like acne and eczema together. And steroids make it worse. So the person sees some, a doctor, and perhaps they get a topical steroid, and that actually will take some of the red away temporarily, but it actually ultimately makes this worse and can even trigger it. So you need to treat them with either a topical clindamycin and or Elidil, but that works for me about 50% of the time. What works almost 100% of the time is oral doxycycline, which is the same thing we use for acne for the same time course as acne, one to two months. 100 twice a day in an adult for one to two months. You can see this in a child. I definitely see it in children. It's less common, but you can see it. And in, those, in, in younger children, we usually don't use doxy. We usually use erythromycin. But you should be familiar with the condition. It looks the same in children. But this is perioral dermatitis. Burn this one into your brain. Burn this picture into your brain because you definitely you already see this in your practice. You might just not be recognizing it. This is looking similar, but this is a different condition. So this is erysematous patches, usually with some papules. But it's not hugging up against the nair there. It's all over the cheeks. And this can be on the arms. It can be anywhere on the face. And this patient will tell you that they get this eruption. Usually the first time they go on vacation in the spring with their family to Mexico, they break out in this rash. 
and this is called polymorphous light eruption, PMLE. It's itchy, usually occurs in the first three decades of life, occurs usually with the first like, significant sun exposures or light exposures. And it's polymorphous, meaning it looks different for different patients, but it's monomorphic for a given patient where it looks the same for a given patient. You treat with sun protection and avoidance and topical steroids if needed. These are things not to be missed. So burn these into your brain because these are things that if you see them or you're thinking about them, you need to make sure it's not these things. So the first one, these are erythematous, flesh-colored, slightly raised, targetoid papules on the palms of a 21-year-old. That description alone should give you the diagnosis. This is pathognomonic for this condition, and this is something that should not be missed. Does anyone know what this is? Okay. Dr. Dally's not allowed to answer. He probably knows that. Okay, yes. This is erythema multiforme. Usually resolves within two to <laughs> usually resolves within two to three weeks. Um, but uh, the common mistake is to treat this treat this with steroids because you say, oh, it's an inflammatory autoimmune condition of the skin. I'm going to treat it with steroids. But the typical trigger for this is HSV, guys. The typical trigger is cold sores. So what you need to do is treat them for their cold sore outbreak with acyclovir, and then this rash resolves. And even if the patient doesn't have a cold sore, there's a lot of good evidence to suggest it's probably still triggering a large percentage of these. So we just treat them with acyclovir even if there's no cold sore in sight. Here's the oral involvement. And if you see oral involvement, it's impossible to differentiate if there's a cold sore going on or if it's just the oral involvement of EM, in which case you refer to it as EM major, right, if there's, if there's mucosal involvement. So EM minor is just skin, EM major is skin plus oral. But either way, what's the treatment? Treatment is acyclovir. Hey, Mark. Most common in young, yeah. Um, isn't, uh, isn't with syphilis that you get lesions on your hands like that? Yeah, you can. So in uh, in syphilis, you can get uh, so primary primary syphilis primary primary syphilis. You get a painless painless ulcer right on your penis or on your genitals. But in secondary syphilis, you get you can get a rash all over your body and on the hands. And it's called the great mimicker because it can mimic a lot of other things. Secondary syphilis, but secondary syphilis is not typically targetoid like that, and you wouldn't see that oral mucosal involvement either. So yes, you would think about it, but you know, it, secondary syphilis isn't super common in this country. I don't know if I've seen that in my entire residency or, or since residency. I don't know if I've ever actually seen a case of uh, secondary or tertiary syphilis. But yeah, you would think about it. Pal oh, well, I worked for sure. on the public health service. Yeah, you could see it. You could see it. I mean, and checking checking a screening in, in the right patient setting is not wrong at all. Um, and you can also check for HSV-1. Don't forget, you can culture HSV. Just swab the lesions uh, and send it off for HSV RNA uh, for PCR, and they will tell you if there's HSV there. So if you're not sure, if you just like with fungus, don't forget you can culture viruses too. Uh, also, these are the infectious causes associated with uh, erythema multiforme. So be aware of these. All of these can, can trigger this. Drugs also, so these drugs can trigger it. This is one not to be missed, not to be missed, not to be missed. If you don't miss anything else in this whole talk, make sure you don't miss melanoma and make sure you don't miss this. So, you know, these are diffuse, erythematous, usually blanchable, um, dusky, purplish uh, patches, sometimes with bulla, um, clearly significantly affecting the mucosal surfaces. I hope everybody knows what this is. This patient probably got started on a new uh, seizure medicine. Okay. Yeah, so this is Stevens Johnson or toxic epidermal necrolysis. It's discussed as a spectrum of the same disease, but in reality, I'm not sure that's true. When you look at these under the microscope, they actually can look pretty different depending on if it's TEN or SJS. But for your purposes, less than 10% detachment is Stevens Johnson, greater than 30% is TEN. In between, they called and overlap. It really doesn't matter to me as long as you know you're on the spectrum of this disease and what to do about it. Um, mucosal involvement, they say, is more common in Stevens Johnson, which again, if we're just defining them based on based on percentage of involvement, then why would we say that mucosal surfaces is more common in one entity when it has nothing to do with that? So, so it doesn't make total sense to me. But regardless, what this is is a, a crazy overreaction 
of your T cells, your TH17 cells, to a certain stimulus, like drugs, like infections. Um, you see uh, the typical rash that I talked about. Um, you typically see uh, this kind of erythematous purplish, but also it can be dusky gray discoloration. Um, and you can sometimes see bulla or vesicles, but not always in the early stages. Nikolsky sign where you give lateral pressure and you see the epidermis detaching from the skin, that is uh, very concerning for SJS or TEN. Mucosal involvement can be, can be absolutely terrible and severe. And I had a patient, I was a medical expert on a, a legal case where this patient was started on a new seizure medicine, Lamictal, and went to the ER complaining, complaining of uh, uh, a bad sunburn uh, throat pain and genital, genital pain, and the ER doctor diagnosed them with strep negative or rapid strep negative pharyngitis, uh, UA negative, urine culture negative, UTI, and a bad sunburn. And this patient had horrible Stephen Johnson and TEN and, and almost died. So these are things you have to have to think about. This is a way to stratify the risk of the patient. So you take all these risk factors and, and you can calculate the likelihood of mortality. And if they have all these things, very bad news for the patient, um, but these are treated like terrible burn patients. These are all the causes or some of the causes. I highlight lamotrigine, lamictal. I highlight NSAIDs, like a ibuprofen, and I highlight um, uh, sulfonamide. I don't prescribe Bactrim in my practice unless somebody really needs Bactrim. Fine, fine. if they have chronic granulomas disease and they need Bactrim prophylaxis because that's what they need, then that's fine. If they need Bactrim for specific reasons uh, for certain infections, that's fine. But there's other things you can use for most infections and not name Bactrim that don't carry with them the risk of this uh, very serious uh, condition. And infections, always think about mycoplasma and HSV, so I put those twice. But um, you want to always think about these, and I usually check for these uh, with some sort of titer, like a mycoplasma titer. You want to withdraw the offending agent. You can do lymphocyte transformation testing. If you don't know what that is, ask Dr. Barnes. Uh, they can do that. Um, and sometimes it can be helpful if they started a lot of different drugs. And if you're going to do anything steroids, they, uh, the data tells me steroids, if anything, cause more infections than they solve any pro and they don't really solve any problems. Uh, IVIG is very borderline whether or not it helps very much at all. But this is an interesting article in 2014. They were treated with Embril, with a Tanercep. 10 patients, and they had a very high likelihood of mortality in these patients based on the score 10, and the median time to healing with all these patients is 8.5 days with no, uh, no patients um, having any mortality. So, you know, these, this targets and blocks TH17 cells, which is why it works for psoriasis and other autoimmune conditions, so why shouldn't it work for uh, Steven Johnson and TEN? So if I had Steven Johnson and TEN, I would be asking for a counter step first and asking questions later. It's just a single dose. You can give it in the ER. This is another one not to be missed. Um, Well-demarcated, large erythematous plaques. I would say the classic description would be in the bathing suit distribution. I'm not showing you that here, but in the bathing suit distribution, it would be classic, usually spares the face. You guys know what this is? This is CTCL or, muco or mycosis fungoides. This is misdiagnosed for years with uh, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis and contact and all these different things. But this is a form of skin cancer called CTCL, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And this needs to be diagnosed by a biopsy. Sometimes you can see erythroderma where you get total body redness. And you need to diagnose, diagnose this with biopsy. Uh, the delay of diagnosis can be like seven to 10 years in these people. And the sooner you can treat it, the better off they are, and the less likely it's going to go to other areas of the body and other organs. So it's important to recognize this early, you well demarcated plaques, bathing suit distribution, um, usually sparing sun exposed areas. And what you see is called epidermotropism, which is trophism, which is where the T cells, which are the little small purple cells, you can see how they are homing to the skin, where they're there's a ton of purple cells, but they're not, there's no inflammation. There's not really fungiosis. There's not anything. They're just all there. So we say too many for too little. Too much T cells for not enough stuff going on. So if we're not sure, you biopsy it. And those collections in the top are called Poitrier's microabscesses, which are a feature of CTCL. 
the point is, if you're concerned about this, this is a reason to biopsy the skin, and you send it to a pathologist who knows what they're looking at. This is an erythematous dusky purplish plaque on the head of the penis. Head of the penis and dusky purplish plaque is pathognomonic for this condition. So this is fixed drug eruption. So this occurs 30 minutes to 8 hours after the drug is taken, and it, it resolves on its own 7 to 10 days. It can sometimes leave a persistent hyperpigmented area there. So the classic things that do this, there are two that I usually remember. One is NSAIDs. Ibuprofen is a really common one to do this. And then certain antibacterials, again, Bactrim would be one, or the, doc, or the tetracycline class of antibiotics. If you're unsure, you can challenge the person, give them a dose of what you think is triggering the rash, and if they flare, then you know that's what it was, because it's fixed, meaning it always occurs in the same location. The genitals is the most common, but it can be other places. So it's like I always get the same rash, and it's always one spot. Start asking about drugs. And usually, people won't tell you about ibuprofen they took unless you ask about it. Um, so that's fixed drug eruption. And then what's left can be something called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So this is after you have inflammation of the skin, not just from fixed drug eruption, but from anything, including eczema. And you can get this brownish residual patch. And it's more common in darker skinned people where we see post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And the point is to counsel the patient. This take, takes months and months to go away. It doesn't usually need treatment. And if you want treatment, we can do things like bleaching creams, like hydroquinone-based creams, or laser treatments. But you don't have to do anything about this. Just counsel the patient that it's basically the paw print of where the animal used to be. That's what they left behind. This is an erythematous annular plaque that has a raised border, scaly raised border, and area of central clearing. So this would be pathognomonic for, let's say, a young patient wrestler. So this isn't a trick question one. Yeah, this is tinea corporis. So corporis is the body, pedis is the foot, madam is the hand. Um, and, but what you see is that central area of clearing, and you see those little bumps along the outside, or you see scaling along the outside. If you scrape it, you see the typical hyphae. Um, but you want to, if you're going to scrape this and look at it under the microscope, this is what a KOH prep looks like under the microscope, you need to scrape the outer edge. So if you're just going to scrape this and send it off for culture, that's awesome. You can do that in your practice. It takes five seconds. Send it to the lab, culture it. You have to scrape the edge. Don't scrape the center where the where the um, clearing is. Scrape the outer edge where the where that the bumpy, scaly area is. And if you're not sure if it's numular dermatitis, if you're not sure if it's coin-shaped eczema or tinea, that's okay. I, I everybody gets confused. Scrape it and then start the person on antifungal cream. Because if you put antifungal cream on numular dermatitis, it's not going to hurt anything, and it might even help because it'll be moisturizing. But if you put a steroid on tinea corporis, if you put strong steroids on tinea, here's tinea pedis, here's capitis with the classic carry-on on the scalp, right? But if you put steroids on tinea, you can create what's called Maoki's granuloma, where you drive the tinea deeper down into the skin. And now instead of treating with two or three weeks of ketoconazole cream, you bought the person four to six weeks of oral terbinafine, and oral antifungal. And you can see how you see that shiny, purpley, it still looks like a circle, but it's all messed up now, and it's shiny and looks deep because you drove that fungus into the dermis. So if you're not sure, scrape it, treat with antifungals, wait for the culture to come back. If it's negative and they don't get better with the antifungal, so switch them to the steroid if you think it's numular dermatitis. So if you're sure, if you're confident, treat them. If you're not sure and you're wondering about tinea, then don't make the mistake of causing someone a Naoki granuloma. Just treat them with an antifungal fruit. You would think this is another photo of tinea, but it's not. This is an annular plaque. Sorry, I would, yeah, I'd say an annular plaque with ra a raised dermal border and central clearing. But you can see how that border is. It's like a perfect circle, and it's raised, and it's, it's firm. It's like there's a dermal component. They're not, it's not just tinea that's in the superficial areas of the skin. It actually now has a dermal component. And on the dorsal hand of, a, of, of somebody, this would be uh, a classic textbook description of this condition. Have you guys heard of this one? This is called granuloma annulare. Okay, this is an inflammatory autoimmune condition of the skin. 
you could easily mistake this for tinea, but what you see is that dermal component and no scaling and usually no redness. It'll kind of be purplish or skin tone, but it's not going to be scaly. It's not going to be itchy. And dorsal hands is classic, but it can actually be a lot of other places. And sometimes people can have a lot of them. Nobody knows exactly what causes this. And treatment can be kind of difficult, but usually it's things like steroids, sometimes intralesional steroids. But you should be aware of this condition because if you're seeing circular things, this is another one that would be in that differential. Psoriasis, erythematous salmon-colored plaques with overlying white or silvery scale. You can classically see nail involvement, right, dystrophic nail. It's TH17 mediated, and so you treat it with things that block TH17 signaling, like TNF-alpha, IL-23, or IL-17, so we have drugs for all those things, the ones you've seen on TV. But it can be really difficult to tell if it's psoriasis or eczema. Some, the best of the best people, still sometimes it's really hard to tell. So use the distribution to help guide you. Eczema is the folds of the elbows, folds of the knees, you know, eyelids. And psoriasis is front of the knees, you know, backs of the elbows, gluteal cleft, um, umbilicus is real classic, genitals, nails. So be familiar with the different distributions because otherwise it's really hard to tell if something is psoriasis or eczema. Um, and if you biopsy it, sometimes even the pathologist has a hard time telling, and they'll just tell you it's psoriasiform dermatitis, and they hedge their bets too. So be familiar with the distributions to help guide you. You can also get gut tape psoriasis, which is teardrop shape instead of the classic plaque psoriasis. This is gut tape psoriasis. If you see gut tape psoriasis, your brain should instantly say, it's probably a child, and they probably had strep recently. Strep is very common to trigger gut tape psoriasis. So be familiar with that. Palm of plant psoriasis is a totally different thing, but another one that's on the palms and soles can be palm of plant psoriasis. You could easily mistake this for one of those other palmar conditions, but they're pustules, and if you biopsy it, it actually looks very similar to regular psoriasis. So it's palm of plant psoriasis. There's also inverse psoriasis. You can get an inverse distribution of any inflammatory skin condition, including psoriasis. You can also get them with other things. So inverse means under the arms, genitals, and under the uh, chest or breast area. I, admit, I personally know I misdiagnosed someone in my allergy fellowship where I, we were treating them for candida with yeast, for yeast infections. We were, bought, we were doing patch testing, and the person probably had inverse psoriasis. Um, so be aware of this condition. All, all that is in the full fungal or candida, you know, it's not always yeast. And this is what psoriasis looks like under the microscope. So you see elongation of the reedy ridges. So you're seeing all these downgrowth of the, of the dermal papilla. They're elongated. Um, and you see hyperkeratosis, where these things are thick. So if you look at that, what should have been normal basket weave orthokeratosis in the stratum corneum, now it's thicker and it has parakeratosis, which means if you look, you can actually see nuclei up there. You're not supposed to see nuclei. You're supposed to see dead cells that are weaved into a basket weave. But because the cells are turning over so fast, they don't have time to extrude their nuclei, and therefore you see nuclei in the epidermis. So you can see how, by taking a biopsy, this might help you. These are the treatments for psoriasis. Take-home point is don't use oral steroids. It makes psoriasis worse. Herpes zoster you're familiar with. This follows along the dermatonal distribution. So this isn't blastoid. Remember, this is dermatomal. Usually likes the trunk, but you can certainly see it on the face, in which case you want to be concerned about eye involvement. But this is, if you see in a band-like pattern, and it's only in one side of the body, think shingles. And remember, you don't have to see the vesicles and shingles. The first thing that happens is the person says, I feel a burny, tingly sensation. Then they just get a few little crops of red papules. And if you're not astute to it, you'll miss it. And 48 to 72 hours will go by, in which case they'd miss their window for antivirals. But be familiar with the classic picture, which is what that is, but also be familiar with how it starts out, because that's how you want to treat it. These are pyritic purplish papules on the feet and wrists of an adult. Usually, um, um, they're pyritic, they're itchy, and you can see they're in a line on the right side there, so they're uh, distributing, they're, they're, um, they're showing a kebnerization, right? The psoriasis kebnerized, which I told you about, but what else kebnerizes? Lichen planus. That's the four Ps, pyritic polygonal purple papules and they're associated with hepatitis C and certain drugs, usually in 30 to 60 years of age. And they look like these shiny purpley areas, 
and someone thought they looked like lichens on a tree, so they called it lichen planus. If you look in their mouth and you're real astute, you'll see oral lichen planus, which is um, shiny white linear patches on the uh, buccal mucosa, and that's called Wickham stria. And you see a dense band-like infiltrate of lymph lymphocytes along the dermal and epidermal junction, um, and that's called a lichenoid reaction pattern. And there's lots of diseases that look like a lichenoid reaction pattern. You might biopsy something, and it comes back as a lichenoid drug reaction, and all they're telling you is there's a dense band-like infiltrate of lymphocytes. Uh, and I, I do like a, a biopsy for the allergist talk if you're ever interested to go over some of these, what you see under the microscope and reaction patterns of these things. And you treat with uh, these, these treatments, topical steroids and other treatments. Another one not to be missed. So this is erythematous, uh, brownish or purplish or bruised-looking papules or macules in the diaper area of a baby. This is another one you should definitely not miss. You guys know what this is? It was named after a medical student, and you've learned about his cells in your, in your immunology lectures. They're antigen presenting cells. Oh. Langerham. What is this? Yep. So this is Langerham cell histiocytosis. Okay. So classically, people mistake this as just diaper rash or seborrheic dermatitis, but this is actually a cancer that the babies need to be treated systemically for so with systemic chemotherapy. This is a for real cancer, but it will present as a skin rash, and you will see seborrheic dermatitis or these bruised echematic areas over the gluteal cleft or the, um, uh, the groin area, the inguinal fold. And, and the more extreme cases, it looks like this. You can see how this could easily be mistaken for cradle cap, bad diaper rash, those type of things. But you always have to think about this when you're thinking about those conditions. It's not like this is common, but when you see it, you need, you need to diagnose it. And the biopsy shows the coffee bean nuclei of Langerhans cells. Um, so they don't have dendritic pro processes. They're just named after Langerhans, Paul Langerhans, who was a medical student uh, when he um, described some of these things and went on to describe uh, Langerhans cells and Langerhans cells with cytosis. Similar to this, but in adults, they call it the seven-year itch. Um, erythematous and pruritic xerotic papules in the genital areas also pathognomonic in the wrist and webbing of the fingers. Um, so this is, we call it the seven-year itch. Scabies. scabies. So genitals and dorsal hands, webbing of the hands and genitals, think scabies. Um, and you can use topical steroids for itch, but you're not going to make the person better. What they need is uh, to be diagnosed either clinically or you can scrape it and look at it under the microscope, and you can put this on just mineral oil and you actually see the little scaby mite walking around. Here's a textbook example of that. Here's one I actually found in a patient. That's a photo I took. And if you have a dermatoscope, you can zoom in and look for the delta wing sign, which is a brown triangle that represents the head of the scabies mite. And you treat with topical permethrin, neck down, wash it off eight hours later, so apply it, wash it off eight hours later, second application in a week, um, and then if they're still not better, you can do ivermectin orally. A lot of times I do both because the oral ivermectin is a lot more reliable than if someone's going to be relied upon to do a cream the correct way. And you don't want to use Lindane. That's old school from medical school um, because it has a black box warning for neurotoxicity. And then brownish, dusky um, macules or papules distributed on the trunk. And if you rub one, it creates this flaring, this histamine release, if you will. Uh, when you rub a lesion, you guys should know what this one is. This will be on your board exam. In fact, rubbing that lesion, they will ask you what that is on your board exam. What is that? You guys know? What? Yeah, what's the sign called when you rub it? Garrier sign. That's right, Garrier sign. Um, <laughs> so it usually occurs in the first year of life. Um, you can evaluate for systemic mastocytosis. Most of the time they don't have that. You treat with antihistamines, and I recommend giving everyone an epinephrine auto-injector, even if they just have urticaria pigmentosa. That would be controversial. However, we know that patients who have mastocytosis are at increased risk for anaphylaxis with the first insect sting. So if they've never been exposed to honey, you know, to honeybee sting and they get stung, they have a much higher chance of anaphylaxing than the general population because they get this massive histamine release. 
So I recommend epinephrine for all these patients. And another EpiPen in the world isn't a bad thing. This is not contact allergy. This is erythematous greasy papules coalesce into a plaque along the anterior chest. And this is another condition called Derrier's disease. Same guy who described Derrier's signs. And this is actually an autosomal dominant genetic defect in a calcium transporter in the skin. Um, this is a rare condition, but I put this one on mainly just food for thought, just to remind you not everything is contact allergy, and sometimes you need a biopsy, sometimes you have to do more with them. It's not always just, you know, dermatitis. And if, if you biopsy it, it looks classic under the microscope, and the pathologist can make this diagnosis in two seconds. This is erythematous serpiginous patches on the back, usually of a female. And this is called SCLE subcutaneous uh, lupus. Basically, just remember this polycyclic kind of figurative look to it, where you see these kind of you know, figure eight shaped uh, areas on the back. This is something that you would refer to a dermatologist. And if it's unilateral and one-sided and looks like that, this is an interesting condition called erythema abigni. This person was laying on a heating pad at night and it causes this look where it kind of accentuates the blood vessels in a brownish look, and the treatment is just simply to diagnose it and remove the heat source. So another interesting one where you could think, this looks like some sort of external trigger. It's obviously just in one area of the body in a distribution that's kind of weird, and just kind of be familiar with this. So I just throw this in there for you. This is one that we see all the time. I know I'm running a little bit over. There's like another five minutes left. Is that okay? Or do you guys want me to stop? I think we're okay. Okay, so this is a really common condition that you should definitely be familiar with. Uh, this is erythematous scaly macules and papules distributed on the sun-exposed areas of an older person's face or arm. This is very common. This is how we make our money in dermatology. You guys know what this is? AC. What? Or AKs. AKs, right, actinic keratosis. This is caused by um, accumulated sun damage from UV radiation in the sun, which leads to um, damage of the DNA and actinic keratosis, which can ultimately result in skin cancers. So about 5% of the time, those will go on to be skin cancers, and you treat them as something destructive, like freezing them, a Mikomod cream again, 5-4 uracil, which is topical chemotherapy cream, things like that. And if you apply topical chemotherapy cream and the person thinks they had an allergic reaction to it, they might show up in your office and say, I started this cream my dermatologist gave me for these things and now I look like this, and you'll say, oh, wow, you look like you're allergic to that cream. We should stop it. But in actuality, he's not allergic. That's what's supposed to happen. So it's like a chemical peel. You're supposed to destroy all the areas of damage. This person had very diffuse damage and got a nice response. This is a good response to the treatment. Um, if I put this on the belly of a two-year-old, nothing would happen because they haven't had damage. So this is supposed to happen. And don't forget skin cancers, so squamous cell carcinoma. This could be, this could look like numular dermatitis to you. This could look like tinea, you know, corporis to you because it's uh, a circular shape. But it has that yellowish area. It's expanding. It is on the place in the body that's had a lot of sun damage. Usually, they're surrounded by actinic keratoses and actinic damage. And this is something that you need to refer to the dermatologist for. Uh, but you should be aware of it. So if it's an older patient. It's on a sun exposed area. Don't forget about skin cancers like squamous cell carcinoma. Putting steroids on this is going to do the patient a disservice. And lastly, immunobolus. This shows up on your boards all the time. So this is one that I see misdiagnosed all the time. The patient gets treated for chronic urticaria is what happens. So they get treated for chronic urticaria. They don't get better. And this is like a 70-year-old with new onset hives, and they treat for chronic urticaria. It doesn't get better. They send them to the dermatologist. And this is bolus pemphigoid. So if you guys saw this with all these bullae, you would make the diagnosis, or at least you would know that it's not chronic urticaria. But remember, the first phase of bullous pemphigoid is the urticaria phase. So it's itchy, it looks like hives, but it's in an older patient. And if it's someone who's, I would say, 60 or older, you need to consider bullous pemphigoid. And for that, it's really simple. You just send them to the dermatologist, I biopsy it. We send it for immunofluorescence. I see the antibodies lining up at, at the dermal, at the dermal junction, and we make a diagnosis because the treatment's not going to be high-dose antihistamines and Zoller. So that's what it looks like on the biopsy, and you can see how it lights up nicely along the DEJ, along the junction. Pepigus vulgaris is another one that has flaccid uh, blisters, can have mucosal involvement. You should definitely remember IgG against desmoglein-3 for Pemphigus and, Ig and against 
um, BP-180 and BP-230 for both pentagoid because those are the proteins that the IgG is binding to, and those always show up on board exams. So please remember those. And you can see a pemphigus that lines up right on the dermal epidermal junction. So you see where the split is. There's a single row of cells at the basal layer. We call that a row of tombstone. And then linear IgA is seen in kids, and it's just, uh, described as a, cl a cluster of jewels, which is a pretty good description. It really does look like that. They're kind of like pretty. Dermatitis trepetiformis is associated with celiac disease. It's another immunobolus condition, and it classically is on the elbows and knees. If a patient's getting elbows and knees and has a history of celiac, that is absolutely going to be pathognomonic for dermatitis trepetiformis. It has nothing to do with herpes. Someone just thought it looked like herpes. Where do you biopsy and what do you transport in if you're going to do immunobolus biopsies? You do a regular shave biopsy, with what I do. I split the specimen in half. And the half that was perilesional, which was not part of the actual lesion, gets sent for immune fluorescence to find those antibodies in the skin. And the half that was part of the lesion gets sent for regular histology. So you have to know where you're biopsying things. If you put the immune fluorescence specimen in the histology, the regular H&E container that contains formaldehyde, you completely just destroyed that specimen. So you put the regular specimen in H&E, you put in um, formaldehyde, and you use something called Michelle's medium for IF, or you can simply just put it in saline, like saline gauze. What you don't want to do is put it in formula, and you just will totally destroy the specimen. One word on topical steroids. What are the fears you guys have with topical steroids? Atrophy, telangiectasia, and stria, right? Don't thin out the skin with topical steroids. So how long do you tell a patient they can use a topical steroid for? These are just some, these are just some derm pearls to finish up just the last minute or two. So how long do you tell a patient you can use topical steroids for? Just who says three? Who says three days? Just say yes if you're going to say three days. Say yes if you're going to say seven days. Say yes if you're going to say fourteen days. Say yes if you're going to say thirty days. Okay, no one said yes to anything. What do you guys do? As long as they have disease. Uh, skin. You guys are you guys are just saying that because doc I gave this lecture to Dr. Dowling before and he says it's you in clinic now probably right is that right? He, he always tells us that in clinic. <laughs> okay, but does he tell you what it's called? Because it's called the Sirota rule. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Does he actually give me credit for it? Come on, it's he the Sirota rule. He always brings you up. Yes. Okay, Langerhans, Langerhans got like five cells named after him, and he didn't even know what they were. He thought islet cells were like, he didn't know that they were insulin. He thought they were like lymphoid cells. Like, he thought, he thought the androgen presenting cells, he thought, he called them dendritic because he thought they were neur neurons. But I actually do know like what these things, what, it, what stuff is, so I should get at least one name. So, so yeah, you can't go from disease to damage. You got to pass through normal, so you already know that. Here's what I use, so desonide, mild, triamphenolone, uh, Mild, you know, mild to moderate, fluosanide, moderate to severe, clobetazole, severe. But remember, these things are potent based off of their vasoconstrictor assays, which means they put the medicine on healthy people's skin and saw when it caused blanching of the skin. That has nothing to do with causing, being likely to cause stria or atrophy. It has nothing to do with how well they work. It has nothing to do with how deeply they can penetrate um, the skin surface. So, you know, although we think of them as, you know, potent or not potent, they were classified that way in a totally uh, uh, abnormal way. So that, that doesn't tell you about their, their adverse effect profile. If someone tests positive to tixocortal 21 pivolate, which topical are they most likely to tolerate? The answer is desoxymetazone. So you have to remember there's four classes of topical steroids, and class C is what people usually can, uh, can tolerate if they have contact allergies. Um, so just remember that. Um, so if they have contact allergy to steroid, you use something from class C, like the methoxymetazone, or clocortolone pivolate, which is cloderm. A word on tube sizes, don't be silly and give someone a tube size that is way lower than what they need for their body surface area. 15 gram is a travel toothpaste, 60 gram is a full toothpaste, and you can order a one pound jar of triamphenolone, 454 grams, and it's super cheap. When steroids fail, you do other stuff like phototherapy, butylimab, I avoid systemic uh, immune suppressants unless they failed uh, or not a candidate for dupilumab if I think they have yeah. certainly atopic dermatitis and I would argue other forms of dermatitis and I'll re I'll re um, affirm that I am I'm a consultant for Regeneron Sanofi but 
we're blocking Th2 cells, so if you're treating Th2 inflammation, that goes beyond atopic dermatitis, so you should consider that. Can I really do a biopsy in the allergy clinic? Yes, you can. It takes about 60 seconds total. It's an added procedure. It helps you when you're trying to differentiate these things, and it's very easy to do, and it's something that everyone should be able to do in their allergy clinic. If you can consider doing rhinoscopy as part of your allergy practice, you could 100% consider doing biopsies. And, you know, that's a procedure that um, helps us diagnostically and also is a, another thing that you go for. This is when you do and don't do a biopsy, and I'm not going to belabor these, but if you ever want to hear a biopsy talk, I do one specifically for allergists. And with that, thank you. Sorry for running over. We started a couple minutes late, and I didn't want to give you guys all these pearls, so I apologize for running over here. But this is my physical practice in Denver. I also have a virtual practice where patients can see me virtually. And um, I am licensed in Missouri and Kansas, so I can see patients virtually in those states. And I, I do consult with other allergists when they have dermatology questions. Um, I have the patients consult with me on there. And I can usually see them the same day or, at worst, the next day. And if you text, out, if you text me and reach out, I'll just overbook them and see them, you know, as soon as I can. So um, if you need a quick dermatologist, I am licensed in those states and I can see patients virtually. So thank you guys very much for coming. It's always really an honor and a pleasure to be invited back to speak um, at my fellowship here. And I learned so much from the fellows and, and from my attendings uh, in my training, and I'm happy to I'll be able to give something back uh, in terms of dermatology knowledge. So thanks for having me. Happy to answer any questions if we have any time for that at all. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, sure. In a patient who, um, if you had a patient who was pregnant who had the perioral dermatitis, would you just stick with the topical clindamycin, or is there an alternative for uh, pregnant patients apart from the doxycycline? Good question. Um, so the first answer is, you know, we don't use tetracyclines for pregnant women because there's a fear, you know, there's a risk for staining of the bones and teeth, right? That's why, like, we stopped using tetracycline in kids. Doxycycline and minocycline doesn't do that. So in a theoretical world, you could give a pregnant patient that, and it would probably be fine. But because it's in the same class of medicine, everyone still kind of doesn't do that. So therefore, you can either start with the topicals, with clindamycin and elidil, and they still can get some benefit from that. You could do the erythromycin if you wanted to. Um, but in reality, she's, it's a woman who's pregnant, and that's, a, that's for a finite period of time. So do we really want to expose them to... Uh, systemic agent for something that is not going to harm them long term. I would argue just treat them with topicals, wait till they deliver, and then give them the antibiotics if they need to, although they still might be breastfeeding. But you could always do the erythromycin, which I think would be reasonable. Okay. Thank you.